Well, welcome everyone. I think we'll, uh, we'll begin. And uh, welcome to another one of our regular Carbon Talk series. Uh, uh, today, uh, we've got a, a speaker I'm delighted to have with us, uh, Dr. Martin Parkinson. And I'll thank uh, Dr. Parkinson, uh, introduce him to in a second. Let me begin by thanking our sponsors, who I must say I'm delighted to see are actually with us today as well. The North Growth Foundation, uh, Mr. Rudy North, uh, uh, who in particular has helped uh, all of our work in Carbon Talks. Nice to see you, Rudy. Uh, as well as uh, the Pacific Institute for Climate Solutions, whose head uh, Tom Peterson is with us as well. And the Pacific Institute uh, funds the videotaping of these Carbon Talks. So as I think many of you know, we live stream them and we video. We then put the podcasts up on our Carbon Talks website for people to look at. There will be quite a few people I know who are watching this uh, alive from their computers wherever they are. So we'll also be taking questions uh, through uh, social media and they'll go to uh, Keen Grunding who will signal me when we get to the Q&A part. Um, I think those are the uh, basic uh, elements. The hashtag uh, for this event is at hashtag Carbon Talks and you can send any questions, those of you who are watching it remotely, to at Carbon Talks. Um, I'll just say a quick word. Our next event, which will for November, will be on November 2nd, and that'll be on resilient renewable cities, an accent on adaptation, a theme that we have not probably devoted as much attention to uh, before as uh, I think is required, and that will be led by Deb Harford, who's also a fellow here at the Center for Dialogue, and Larry Beasley, and register in the usual way. So uh, let me introduce our speaker. And our speaker uh, was, I first met, as some of you may know, I, my previous role before coming here, I was Canada's High Commissioner to Australia. And in my first week or two in the job, I was going around various government departments in Canberra. And I met uh, Dr. Parkinson, who at that point was the Secretary of the Department of Climate Change. And he sat down very generously and said, uh, more or less the first sentence, or after hello, good day, was, um, you should probably know that this issue of carbon pricing has already caused the downfall of two prime ministers and one leader of the opposition, and it looks like the whole cycle is starting again. That was September of 2010. Well, indeed, the whole cycle carried on for another round. I think you can safely say another prime minister was a casualty of that, um, not, uh, and possibly two, but I'll let you do the body count. Mm -hmm. Uh, but this is an issue that is not, uh, as much as there's a lot of economic abstractions, there's a lot of personal personalities and politics involved. So it's a fascinating case. It's an important case. It's important for Canadians, um, much as Australia is, of course, in a different part of the world. Uh, as is so often said, there's so many structural similarities between our political systems, the makeup of our economy, and in the case of climate change, as resource exporting countries issues that we both have to confront, and certainly, without a doubt, very similar political, if not political, rules of the game, the way that public expectations from government and the way political parties interact. So all of that, I think, makes this uh, an examination of the Australian experience very relevant, and really no one is better placed to unpack it for us than, than Martin. Uh, and I think with that, um, I should also simply say he didn't just do climate change, much as that's the focus of this. Martin was a career Treasury official with the Australian government for 34 years and rose to the very top of his profession. After finishing as Secretary of Climate Change, he became the Secretary of Treasury, which would be the equivalent of Canada being the Deputy Minister of Finance. So, and uh, finished that, that job at the end of last year mm -hmm. and is now uh, lecturing in North America, Australia, and beyond. So, with no further ado, Martin, I'll let you give your talk. Thanks. Thanks, Michael. Um, just bear with me while I put this up just so I can stand. I'm more comfortable doing that. Um, what I'm going to do, uh, th there's an element of the sort of Shakespearean tragedy about um, this experience in Australia. So I'm going to put up um, a list of names because um, uh, I'll come back to, uh, to these through the... Um, through the course of the presentation. So I'll just leave that up there for the moment. I'll take it down as I put up some other slides, but um, uh, I'll come back uh, as we go through. Uh, the second thing I just want to say is um, that uh, if there are any questions as we go through, um, points of clarification, I'm either I'm quite happy to take them as we go or to wait till the end. It's really up to, uh, up to you. Now, um, 
While Australia is responsible for only 1.3% of the world's emissions, so slightly uh, less than Canada's 1.6, we are the world's highest per capita emitters. Uh, we're also probably the most vulnerable developed economy to climate change, both to the direct impacts on terms of um, uh, agriculture and water and, and from severe weather events, but also given our industrial structure to the policy response that other countries might take uh, in response to climate change. That is, um, we are very heavily fossil fuel dependent. Um, half of our, uh, uh, um, sorry, 40% of our emissions uh, are actually related to our resource exports. Um, so uh, it's a very, very significant uh, threat to Australia's economic prosperity if other countries um, respond uh, through uh, particular types of policies. Now, estimates by the Garno Review, uh, which was uh, a, a sort of Australian equivalent of the Stern Review, suggest that the climate change risks the loss of half of all irrigated agriculture in our Murray-Darling Basin, um, which is the nation's food bowl, by 2030, and the entire loss of um, irrigated agriculture by 2100. In the driest inhabited uh, continent on the planet, climate change also poses a threat to water supplies, while severe weather events and rising sea level threaten significant areas of habitation and large parts of our infrastructure. So you'd think that climate change would be front and centre as an issue that Australians really felt they had to get to grips with. Yet despite all of this, climate change has been a source of considerable angst in Australia. Uh, indeed, um, dramatic controversy. Since 2007, it's played a major role in the demise of um, uh, Prime Ministers John Howard, uh, Kevin Rudd and Julia Gillard, and opposition leaders Brendan Nelson and uh, Malcolm Turnbull. Now, this controversy reflects both a passionate rejection of the science on the part of some and a concern about moving ahead of the rest of the world by others. It's also been fueled by the political manoeuvring of some of the proponents of action who really have engaged in rhetorical overreach and rejected approaches that would have garnered the support of the mainstream approaches that would have cemented into um, the fabric of the Australian economy sustained and substantial emissions reductions. Fear of moving ahead of the rest of the world has a striking um, degree of currency in Australia. And that's despite the fact that even when we were in the world of introducing um, a carbon price, we were not actually at the front of the pack. For example, when China announced it would trial uh, emissions trading schemes, this suggest the suggestion that this would actually happen was loudly rejected by many in the, um, in the commentary. When they actually started seven separate trials, they were dismissed as not real. When the price of those uh, trial sites varied between 20 and 40 yuan, so basically around four to eight dollars, not much different to Australia's price, the evidence was just ignored and now that China's made a commitment to go to a national scheme uh, from 2017, we'll just have to wait and see what the uh, sceptics say about that. What I want to do today, though, is um, describe where Australia finds itself, <coughs> then look back at the economics and politics of climate policy in Australia over the last 20 years. In doing so, I'm going to focus on the stillborn emissions trading scheme, the so-called carbon pollution reduction scheme, and then on its um, uh, successfully implemented but now abolished carbon pricing mechanism, which was essentially what was referred to as a carbon tax. I'll then come back and talk a little bit about direct action, which was the plan introduced by um, Tony Abbott uh, when he became Prime Minister. Uh, and uh, I'll also talk about Australia's post-2020 commitments, particularly in light of the change of Prime Minister two weeks ago from Tony Abbott to Malcolm Turnbull. And if you notice that uh, Rudd to Gillard to Rudd uh, were all changes within the Labor Party and Abbott to Turnbull is a change within the Liberal Party. So while the Prime Ministers have changed, the only time government has changed is actually in, um, 
1996, uh, in 2007, and then again in 2013. Uh, I'm not going to talk about uh, adaptation. I'm not going to talk about um, other mitigation policies, though all of those have challenges in their own right. Now, Australian governments, Commonwealth, state and local, have been um, implementing a range of policies to reduce emissions over the last 20 years. As a result of both those policy decisions and changes to our industrial structure, our emissions in 2014 were broadly the same as in 1990, notwithstanding a doubling in the size of the economy. As a result, the emissions intensity of the economy has halved over that time, and given our very rapid population growth, emissions per capita <coughs> have fallen significantly. So you can see here... Um, Right. Here we go. Uh, this was our um, quell row, so our um, target in uh, the uh, first Kyoto period, uh, and this is the actuals. This is where we find ourselves now. Um, we're not much different from uh, 1990, and we're not much different from 2000, but we do still expect fairly significant increase in emissions out to 2020, and then continuing growth in emissions um, beyond there. Now, over the period to um, the, the first Kyoto period, the fact is we had a target of 108% of 1990 emissions, and we actually ended up uh, emitting about 104%. As a result of that, we've got a carryover into the second period of 120, 129 um, megatons. Now, in that period to 2020, uh, we've got bipartisan support for a commitment to reduce emissions by 5%. Now, uh, I mentioned that uh, in 2000 and um, 1990, there's really not much difference in the level of emissions. Uh, the main reason for that is because uh, we ended large-scale land clearing uh, during the 1990s. So that explains that drop from 1990 and then um, the subsequent uh, upward trend which reasserted itself. But if you look out to um, 2020, even after the 129 million uh, tonne uh, carryover uh, over that, um, uh, that period from 2012 to 2020, we've still got to reduce emissions in 2020 by 126 million tonnes or over this entire period by a cumulative 236 uh, million tonnes. Interestingly, the abatement task has become smaller over time. Now, this, um, this here is our uh, projections of um, emissions in 2008. Uh, this is um, 2012, 2013, and this is the current set of um, projections now. But look here too. It's not just that um, our forecasts have changed, our history's changed. So what's, what's going on? Um, so it's actually really interesting. This, the more accurate data we've got now on actual emissions reflects two things. First, in 2007, uh, the Howard government, um, with Malcolm Turnbull, uh, who's now the Prime Minister, who was then Environment Minister, introduced something called the National Greenhouse and Energy Reporting Scheme. Uh, and that required companies to measure their emissions and report them to government. So first up, we, from about 2007 onwards, we started to get uh, accurate data rather than estimating. And then the second thing is, when we were introducing the cap-and-trade emissions trading scheme, it, uh, the coal miners were faced with the choice of using accepted global default factors or going actually out and measuring their emissions. And they went out and measured their emissions and, lo and behold, found the fact that their emissions were, particularly their future emissions, were a lot lower than anybody had actually been um, anticipating. The forecasts emissions 
um, have slowed quite dramatically on the back of very large rises in electricity prices, which were due to higher network charges, so they were not related to the introduction of the emissions trading scheme, and industrial restructuring in the face of declining competitiveness because the terms of trade boom that Australia has been through forced up the Australian dollar dramatically. So, sorry, if we think about um, the cumulative reduction task uh, over the period um, out to 2020, you can see that it's uh, the time we uh, started to plan the introduction of the emissions trading scheme, we thought we had to reduce emissions by 1,335 um, uh, megatons, and now uh, with the carryover, we're down to having to reduce emissions by 236. Now, that's still a significant task, and um, achieving least cost abatement should be a priority. As I'll describe shortly, uh, the Rudd and Gillard government sought a carbon price with the intention of delivering emissions 5% below 2000 levels. Um, and as I said, 2000 or 1990 is essentially interchangeable in Australia. And a willingness to go for deeper cuts to 15 to 25% below 2000 levels if other countries made similar um, reduction efforts. Now, given Australia's strong population growth, these targets would have required very significant reductions in emissions per capita. And this, this is going to be the... This, what I'm going to show you now is actually going to highlight one of the big issues that we faced in Australia. So, and that, that was that people did not understand what business as usual looked like. So if we go back here, when we're designing the emissions trading scheme first up, this is, this is the reality we're looking at. And we're thinking we need really big instruments that are going to make big change. But 5% below 2,000 levels sounded like really small change. In actual fact, if these are emissions per capita, 5% below 2,000 required you to reduce emissions to 66% of what they'd been in 1990 on a per capita basis. If you went for 25%, by 2020, you had to halve emissions per capita. Um, over that period. Now, on the basis of the modelling that we did for the introduction of the carbon price, uh, it wouldn't have actually cost very much in terms of foregone national income per capita. Indeed, going from 5 to 15% would have cost less than two one-hundredths of 1% 1 in per capita income growth by the time you get to 2020. Now, as it turned out, though, um, I want you to sort of keep in mind what this business as usual, um, sorry, what the 5% below 2,000 means in terms of per capita emissions because people did not understand what business as usual meant in Australia and in the Australian context. And I, I, you'll, as I go through this, you'll see why this is important. Now, with the election of the Abbott government... Um, I'll, I'll just leave that there. The election of the Abbott government, um, it abolished uh, the carbon price um, in favour of uh, what it called its direct action plan. Now, we've made a post-2020 commitment like other countries uh, and Prime Minister Abbott uh, announced this just recently that Australia would aim to reduce emissions by between 26 and 28% below 2005 levels by 2030. Now, compare this to what the government's own advisory board, the Climate Change uh, Authority, recommended, which was that if we were serious about the two-degree target, then Australia's fair contribution was 40 to 60% by 2030. Now, a number of observations can be made about the commitment that the Abbott government has made. First, while I'm now out of government, this target seems to me to, be, be, to have been carefully chosen to show that we were taking some action, but not too much. It's more than what Japan and Korea have committed to, and in terms of um, emissions intensity, it's a reduction on par with that of China. As such, it would see emissions per unit of GDP fall by 64%, and emissions per person halve between 2005 and 2030. 
Second, by moving the base to 2005, the quantum of the reduction seems larger than if the base had remained at 1990 or 2000 levels. Um, we're not alone uh, at doing this, um, but the, it does mean that 26 to 28 percent below 2005 levels is akin to something like 20 percent below 2000. In fact, if we turn the 2020 target into uh, of 5 percent below 2000 into a reduction relative to 2005, that'd be a 13 percent reduction. So, in other words, there's really not much more um, action over the 10 years from 2030 to 2020 to 2030 than there will have been over the period to 2020. Third, whether Australia's contribution is seen as fair is up to others to judge. But what we do know from the 35 odd countries that have put commitments on the table, the cumulative reductions are not sufficient to avoid the two degree target. Now, as I said, Prime Minister Abbott was replaced as um, leader of his party and hence as Prime Minister um, two weeks ago. And the new Prime Minister is Malcolm Turnbull, who uh, had been opposition leader uh, in the period 2008-2009. Uh, Turnbull had lost the leadership of the Liberal Party um, and hence uh, as opposition leader over his support for action on climate change, and in particular for his support for the Rudd government's efforts to introduce emissions trading. This has led some people to believe that the elevation of Mr Turnbull to the Prime Ministership will see Australia move quickly to increase its 2030 target and to reintroduce a carbon price. As you'll see as I go through the presentation, uh, I think that that is actually uh, unlikely that um, we'll see a dramatic change of policy in the short term. I think the more likely outcome is that Australia moves from being a blocker of international action to being a supporter, but not, is not able to go back to playing, <coughs> excuse me, to playing the global leadership role. Indeed, the new Prime Minister's early comments have reaffirmed direct action as central to his government's policy, noting that there's a commitment to review direct action in the light of experience in 2017-18 um, with a view to seeing whether that will be sufficient to deliver the 2030 target. As you'll see as we go through the rest of the discussion, climate change policy in Australia is an area where there's a gap between the means and the ends. And that doesn't make any strategic sense if you're actually focused on your national interest. As such, I think it's inevitable that we will return to the question of how or sorry, of how much um, to reduce and how to reduce emissions, um, but I can't give you any confidence about over what time frame. I, my personal um, sus uh, suspicion is that it'll be that 2017 um, review of direct action that gives us the, the option. So how did we get here? The history of policy making in Australia has really been one of governments progressively removing themselves from allocative decision making in favour of letting market based responses um, play out. And the move to pricing greenhouse gas emissions through an emissions trading scheme or through a carbon price was been, has been seen by many as the next logical progression for that uh, policy approach in Australia. However, before the Gillard government's attempt to, uh, or sorry, actual introduction of the carbon pricing mechanism, We'd never ever managed to, uh, to implement a nationwide market-based reform that managed a global externality. So it's that, that's an important distinction, right? What, so the debate over using an economic instrument has been around for about 20 years. Uh, Senator John Faulkner, who was the environment minister in Paul Keating's Labor government in 1995, proposed uh, a carbon levy set at $1.25 a tonne. That faced strong opposition and was put aside. In 1999, under the Howard um, Coalition Government, Liberal National Party Coalition, uh, and for those of you who don't know Australian politics, liberal means conservative. Um, <laughs> uh, in 1999, at the instigation of Senator Robert Hill, who was then the <coughs> Environment Minister um, in the Howard Coalition Government, the Greenhouse Office released 
a series of four discussion papers over design of a possible emissions trading scheme. This was the first detailed exposition of what a carbon pricing mechanism might entail, and there was an expectation that this would be followed up by further work as we move towards the implementation of that. But in 2000, the government decided not to proceed with, uh, that, with that work. In 2002, the Council of Australian Governments, so it's the collection of the Commonwealth and the uh, state um, governments, uh, had an uh, energy market review which was chaired by um, Warwick Parra and he'd been the Minister for Energy and Resources in the Howard Government and recently stepped down and much to everybody's surprise, his review recommended the introduction of a national emissions trading scheme. In 2003, an emissions trading scheme proposal was taken to the Howard Cabinet again uh, with the support of four ministers and in particular um, sponsored by the Treasurer, so the Finance Minister, Peter Costello, and again the decision was taken not to proceed. Partly as a result of that decision, the eight state and territory governments jointly established a National Emissions Trading Task Force which um, was asked to design uh, a, an emissions trading scheme that the states could collectively um, introduce. It produced a number of papers, held a wide-ranging dialogue with stakeholders between 2005 to 2007, and provided really important input into the Gano Review. Where things change, though, is in 2006, where the Howard government establishes a task group on emissions trading chaired by the head of the Prime Minister's department, so the, um, the clerk of the Privy Council, Peter Shergold. And the idea there was to reconsider the possibility of an emissions trading scheme, and I was asked to head up the secretariat of that group. Now, the initial reaction of the media and the environment groups was that this was a complete smokescreen. This was just a group of people who were being brought together um, and they'd produce a report that would say, yes, we should do this at some point in the future, but don't do it now. What they didn't know, and they were particularly... Um, convinced of this because there were 12 people on the review, five of whom were secretaries or deputy ministers in Canadian parlance and seven of whom were business people. And so they were convinced that this was um, already cooked up. What they didn't know was actually that at the very first meeting of this task group, we went around the table and every single member indicated a very strong presumption in favour of acting on climate change and acting now, and a very strong desire to ignore the restraints imposed on us by the terms of reference the government had given the group. So it is one of those examples that if you are going to set up a review, you better have an idea um, of what the position the reviewers might take. So the Shergold review was released in um, May 2007, and to the surprise of many, concluded Australia should act on climate change, it should start acting unilaterally, it should have an emissions trading um, scheme. Oh, and by the way, look at all these appendices to the report, we've actually spent quite a lot of time beginning to design some of the key features because we needed to convince ourselves that we could make it work. Again, to the surprise of many, on 3 June 2007, Prime Minister Howard actually said the government's going to adopt the report and is going to have an emissions trading scheme in place by 2012. That meant that when we went to the 2007 election, we had both major parties, the Australian Labor Party and the Liberal National Party Coalition, um, arguing in favour of emissions trading. So why had Howard changed his position? Basically, um, a couple of things had happened. First, the business community jumped over the government. So... The government had responded time and time again to pressure from the business community not to introduce an emissions trading scheme, but the business community was looking at what was happening around the world. They could see the potential election of a Labor government in 2007, and they were really facing quite considerable public disquiet because we're in the midst of the millennium drought, which is a drought that basically ran for almost 10 years in Australia. So... They took the view that they'd rather see the Howard government introduce an emissions trading scheme rather than maintaining its long-standing opposition. Now, as it turned out, in November 2007, the Rudd government was elected 
Mr Rudd decided he wanted to uh, establish the first Department of Climate Change in Australia, uh, and I was asked to, um, to head that. Out of that came the Garneau Review, uh, very comprehensive, in fact, the most comprehensive modelling exercise ever done around climate change anywhere in the world, um, which was led by the Australian Treasury, and a green paper and a white paper uh, aimed at introducing the Carbon Pollution Reduction Scheme, CPRS, or uh, a cap and trade system. Um, now, the Rudd government spent considerable effort in the run up to Copenhagen in 2009 trying to gain parliamentary endorsement for this scheme. It needed the support of either the Greens or the Liberal National Party opposition in the Senate because it didn't have a majority in the Senate. The Australian Greens Party and many environment groups were strongly uh, opposed to the CPRS and refused to support its passage. The reasons for this were many and varied, but a common theme was concern about the strength of the targets, a direct result of what I was saying before about people not understanding business as usual. There was considerable concern also that a national cap did not mean that every individual emitter would be forced to reduce their gross emissions and the action of any individual household to lower its emissions, say by putting a solar panel on the roof, wouldn't actually result in a reduction in the national cap. And finally, there was a very strong negative reaction to the fact that coal-fired electricity generators were going to see some, receive some partial compensation for the loss of um, enterprise value that was going to occur to them. Now the injection, um, oh well just actually before I leave that, uh, why was there such a strong negative reaction? Um, so remember what's happening here is you're actually going to lower the, the value, the market value of these firms and hence you're going to impose big losses on the shareholders. So you could have gone out for contracts to close, sort of allowed an auction to, um, to run uh, and get the, the entities to close that way, or you could do it through partial compensation uh, and let them close uh, as they chose. In actual fact, why the Green Groups were so opposed is that it was a very, very strong argument mounted by them that the coal industry had to be penalised because the coal industry had done so much damage. So it was really a moral argument and it, this injection of a moral argument into the design of an economically efficient instrument uh, which was intended to reduce emissions by a minimum of 1,335 megatons um, caused great angst. Now, Malcolm Turnbull provided in principle support for the emissions trading scheme but his Liberal Party, i.e. His, his Conservative Party, was split in the issue, notwithstanding that the bulk of the CPRS was in fact what John Howard had committed to and taken them into the 2007 election. Their coalition partner, the smaller National Party, was vehemently opposed uh, and um, uh, threatened to actually leave the coalition uh, if, uh, if uh, support for emissions trading was carried through. In an attempt to find a compromise, the government and the opposition negotiated a series of modifications, principally around the extent of assistance to industries, which just entrenched the opposition from um, the Green Groups. Now, despite the concessions made to Turnbull by the government, um, the uh, position that he'd taken was so much at odds with many of his uh, members of his party that he was replaced as opposition leader by Tony Abbott, who immediately held a secret ballot, uh, of coalition parliamentarians and uh, the result of that was they took a decision to um, withhold support from the ETS. So the carbon pollution reduction scheme was defeated. Now, um, at the time, uh, and notwithstanding the outcome of the Copenhagen COP, Prime Minister Rudd was incredibly popular uh, and many in his own party urged him to call a double dissolution, which is where you dissolve the House and you dissolve um, the Senate uh, and you, everything gets thrown up in the air. Uh, now, he was so popular that he could have done that and, in my view, would probably have won and won comfortably 
in which case emissions trading scheme would have become law. Instead, what he did in April 2010, so four months, three months after the COP failure, he announced a deferral of efforts to legislate um, to address climate change until 2012. So for a man who had championed and campaigned that climate change was, quote, the greatest economic, social and moral challenge of our time, unquote, the abandonment of what had been seen by the public as one of his core beliefs led to a significant loss of public support and it exacerbated tensions around his leadership um, within his party and he was replaced as shortly thereafter um, by Julia Gillard who became Prime Minister in June 2010. Ms Gillard moved quickly to call an election. During the election campaign she stated that she supported a price on carbon um, and should prosecute the case for action as long as she needed to to win community support. However, she also said she would not introduce carbon pricing until there was a sufficient consensus on the issue and she specifically ruled out the introduction of a carbon tax. Now, the result of this election left Australia with its first hung parliament in 70 years. To form a majority in the House of Representatives, the two major parties needed the support of the crossbenchers uh, and included the Greens. After two weeks of deliberation, Julia Gillard had won enough support from those independents to form government, um, but to do that, she had to rely on the support of the Greens. And one of their requirements was the establishment of a cross-party parliamentary committee to design um, policy on climate change. This was done uh, after some months of deliberation. This multi-party committee agreed on the introduction of a fixed carbon price commencing on the 1st of July 2012. So, ironically, the date at which John Howard's um, uh, commitment in 2007 would have come into effect, transitioning to a flexible price cap and trade emissions trading scheme in 2015. As the price of the permits was fixed for the first three years and the supply unlimited, this quickly became referred to as carbon tax. At the press conference when Ms Gillard announced this, she was flanked by the Independents and the Greens, and this indelibly imprinted in the memory of the Australian public this idea that she was hostage to the minor party. The Abbott opposition um, exploited this mercilessly, uh, accusing her of breaking election promise not to introduce carbon tax, and she seemed incapable of explaining to the public that circumstances had changed and therefore she'd had to modify her position. Mr Abbott stated the next election would be a referendum on climate policy uh, and carbon tax in particular and pledged its repeal, which he did on becoming Prime Minister in September 2013. Interestingly, he's never publicly rejected the emissions reduction target, even though he's widely reported to uh, have said, quotes, that it was absolute crap, unquote. Since it's difficult to campaign for an objective without a means to achieve it, the opposition adopted a policy it called direct action, at the heart of which sits uh, a reverse auction where the government's a monopsony purchaser of abatement from the private sector. Now, uh, let me quickly go through um, some of the lessons out of this. Uh, I can talk about direct action if people want, but I'll leave that and come back in, in terms of the Q&A. Now, stiff opposition from groups supporting the status quo has been a key feature of all major economic reforms in Australia. And this ETS carbon tax debate has been no different. There is an important distinction though, and that is that the, the CPRS, unlike other reforms, faced opposition from both sides to what was essentially um, a middle of the road proposal. The carbon tax didn't have that, not because the target was different, not because the mechanism was different, but because the Greens and the independents had been in the tent, uh, so to speak, when it was being designed. The CPRS received criticism from those who were both for and against action to mitigate climate um, change. As I said, the environmental groups thought the targets were too low, and the level of the assistance and compensation was too high. Industry and business groups believed the opposite. Um, there are some key differences, though, between the introduction of carbon price and the other sorts of major economic reforms that have been done in Australia. 
First, those other reforms were always situated clearly within the confines of the economics discipline and dealt with problems that were strongly defined and understood by economists and commentators. Um, in contrast, climate change is a complex, multi-dimensional issue spanning economic, environmental and science disciplines. It requires analysis over time frames far greater than normally considered by society and ultimately requires a coordinated international response given the global commons problem. It's therefore considerably more difficult to make sure you're making a meaningful contribution to solving the problem. The actions of other key players are going to confound what you do. The climate benefits of action today remain uncertain uh, and are only likely to occur over decades to come. And the economic framework uh, to assess the value of action and the cost of inaction continues to be debated. Compare that to the sorts of previous reforms that countries have introduced, and particularly Australia where unilateral action by Australia, uh, whether it's on trade policy, whether it's in deregulating its financial market, deregulating um, its labour market, the benefits all flow directly to Australia. Uh, you're not dependent on what any other country might do because they've all been about removing domestic regulatory impediments to an efficient market-driven allocation of resources. Also, um, unlike... Uh, other early reforms, improving greenhouse gas outcomes cannot be achieved by relying on market deregulation. It requires intervention in some form by governments to avoid the tragedy of the global commons. Now, this requirement of intervention by government and the fact that um, uh, Australia might not benefit from taking action if other countries um, uh, offset what Australia does, created um, some really significant dilemmas for the Australian economics profession, which I have to say um, ultimately played a very unhelpful role in the political debate in Australia. And it's really odd that you'd say this about a bunch of economists. Despite two decades of work in the Australian public sector, very few academic economists had spent any time thinking about um, what were the right instruments to address um, uh, global warming. So very quickly, their conceptual support for um, a pricing mechanism and um, a market-based response gave way to interminable debates about particular elements of, um, of a scheme, most of which were thought bubbles by people who'd never stopped to think about the issue. They were impractical, they were impossible to implement in effect, or they paid absolutely no attention to the international agreements which were already in place. So the economics profession started in Australia, the academic profession started as if there was a blank sheet of paper and this was just Australia doing this all on its own. Moreover, while economists have um, significant experience dealing with marginal issues, that is issues where changes at the margin are the important thing, they have relatively little experience with issues that involve potentially catastrophic outcomes. So the work of people like Krugman, Paul Krugman and Marty Weitzman um, and uh, that emphasis on low probability but catastrophic events seem to be little recognised in the Australian um, profession. Uh, nor uh, were the academic economists convinced that uncertainty around such events strengthens the case for action rather than strengthening the case for inaction. It's because, of, because of the catastrophic nature of the events, it actually changes the option value in ways that are not um, necessarily intuitive even to economists. The best thing, though, was that some economists took it on themselves to begin to dispute the underlying science of climate change, which I have to say was um, an interesting phenomenon to watch. Now, while the academic economic profession was unhelpful in the public debate, the fact that public sector economists, and particular economists from the Treasury, were designing the emissions trading scheme, uh, and that climate change was being seen as requiring an economic response, led to considerable resentment amongst those people who you might think of as um, having a vocation, vocational calling around the environment. 
Um, to give you an example, um, there was a lot of confusion about what people were talking about. Most environmental groups would sit in um, meetings with me and say, absolutely, we have to have an economy-wide approach that is least cost. Yep, absolutely agreed, yep. Um, and then they'd say, but everybody has to share in the reductions. And you'd say, but that's not what an emissions trading scheme will do. Uh, the emissions trading scheme will actually deliver you reductions where it is cheapest to deliver, um, and the price will rise to ensure the amount of reductions that are required under the national cap. No, we can't have that. Everybody has to share in this equally. Everybody has to um, uh, reduce their emissions by the same proportionate amount, and we have to do it through an emissions trading scheme. The fact that these two ideas were fundamentally incompatible was um, something that many of them um, couldn't, get a, couldn't get their head around. And as I said, others had a very explicit agenda that the coal industry had to be punished. Uh, and that was the language that was used. So those of us designing the scheme also um, made mistakes, um, one of which I think is really important in the context of um, what's been done here in BC. And that was that we didn't pay enough attention to the concept of salience. So what do I mean by salience? Um, let me go back here. So we, we knew on the evidence available to us at the time that we were trying to abate out over the period of 2020 um, 1,335 megatons uh, and that um, uh, beyond that we needed to keep, keep going and deliver massive um, reductions. Because of that, we focused, and I know I focused very much on what are the things that are going to be the really big changes. And people would say, what about putting solar panels on the roof of every house in the country? And I'd say, OK, um, let's think about this conceptually. If we do that, we will save 13 million tonnes, 13 megatons a year in emissions and it will cost us probably a $250 billion or a quarter of a trillion dollars. Um, and if we do that, and we do that for 10 years, we've got 130 million tonnes, and we've only still got to find another 1,200 million tonnes. So my response was, look, that's all playing around at the, at the margin, that's Mickey Mouse, that's not going to get us where we need to be. What I didn't recognise, I didn't pay enough attention to, was the fact that people really wanted to feel as though they were making a contribution. And I think with hindsight that um, we underestimated that and that um, uh, probably... Uh, is what lies behind the incredibly high take-up of solar PV rooftop systems in Australia um, now. All that said, it was probably also the case that the Rudd government in the case of the CPRS and the Gillard government in the case of the carbon tax lacked the political discipline and communication skills needed to win the public debate. Um, it was uh, quite striking how difficult they found it to put this, this argument in terms that would resonate with the community. What was equally striking, actually, was how the politicians had signed up to this in opposition, but they themselves did not understand what they'd committed to. And finally, the timing of the global financial crisis can't be um, uh, overemphasised. It undermined the support of many of the sensible people in the business community who'd been, favor in, who'd been in favour of action because their entire focus shifted from uh, the precautionary principle, we should be taking action here to deal with this problem, to an entire focus on trying to keep their businesses alive in the midst of the global crisis. Uh, Michael, that's a, qu a quick run through the politics and economics. Um, I can talk about direct action. I can talk about um, uh, any of the elements of the individual schemes if people uh, are interested. 
but I think the best thing is for me to be in your hands and take questions. Well, thank you very much, Martin. Uh, that's a, uh, a ter terrific run-through. I mean, if I was to kind of try to put it in a simplistic way, you told us a story about a scheme that was designed, a cap-and-trade scheme that was designed but failed politically in terms of getting parliamentary approval in 2008-2009. Then another scheme, that, which a carbon tax, at least initially, I'd call the carbon tax, which did succeed politically with a different constellation of support, was legislated and ran for a year and a half mm -hmm. uh, and produced some results, but faced virulent opposition from the opposition party, which made it a, a banner issue. And when they won government, having pronounced that their election would be considered a referendum on it, that was immediately abolished and now replaced by a third direct action scheme, which for I think most people in the room will appreciate, is in broad measure similar to the kinds of regulatory measures the Canadian government has been pursuing yeah. since the approximately the mid to late 2000s. So three different schemes, and if I understand, you know, I'll just add this, uh, as I understand it, both the Greens and the Labour Party are still quite committed to taking action on pricing carbon. Yep. They may be less precise about how they will do it the next time they get a chance, certainly Labour, to form government, but... Labour will have another chance at some point to form government, and they remain committed to it. They haven't walked away from it. So the controversy continues, and if I may just add a brief comment before we go to the audience. The thing that, as a Canadian living in Australia, uh, watching all this, um, the Canadian government had uh, its pretty clear policy, so it, you know I was an observer rather than a direct interlocutor. There wasn't going to be a lot that was going to change about Canadian thinking about where Australia was going once the Canadian government had pretty much settled on the path that it's on by about 2009. Um, but what struck me was just the intensity of the debate. And, I mean, all of us are here because we're interested in the issues of carbon, uh, uh, climate change and carbon pricing. But just as an ordinary observer, you could simply could not have watched read newspapers or mm -hmm. watched any news at, on any week of the year in pretty much the whole time period you're talking about from 2007 right through to... 2014 without hearing about climate change pricing and debates over that as being a top of mind political debate issue. And that was for me the biggest striking contrast with the Canadian environment really after the 2008 Canadian election when the Liberal Party's green shift, which was a broader focus exercise, was, I mean, the Liberal Party lost the election and, and then it kind of cease to put emphasis on that action. So um, that's a little bit of commentary. Uh, there are other questions I could ask you, but I think keen, people will be keen to put questions from the audience. I will say, normally we run these things to 1.30, but because uh, the talk was longer and because Martin has the time, I will run the question period for longer, depending on, on interest. So we don't need to wrap up, although, of yeah. course, people are free to go, uh, depending on your schedules. So we'll, we'll start so. here with um, these two ladies at the back. Hi, I'm just wondering about the, the communications piece. If you say that Australians were failing to understand what business as usual looked like yep. and thought that 5% below 2,000 levels was not appropriate, if 2,000 levels were similar to 1990 levels, why didn't you just say 5% below 1990 levels? That's a very good question. Um, and um, uh, as I said, the politicians not understanding what they committed to. Um, uh, Kevin Rudd made this commitment in 2000 terms... Um, while he was in opposition, uh, and he wouldn't, he wouldn't budge from that. Um, and in fact, uh, ironically, if we had couched it in terms of um, we're going to uh, reduce um, uh, emissions by 17% in 2020 below 2,000 levels or below 1990 levels, which is essentially what 5% below... Sorry. If we'd couched it in terms of we're going to reduce emissions by 17% below business as usual levels, that would have been exactly the same as the 5%, and 17% would have sounded like a bigger number. And that, that sort of communication bit is really, really important. And I, I was talking with Tom this morning and, and with um, colleagues yesterday. Uh, one of the things that I think is really interesting in the difference between the BC experience and the Australian experience is how much effort was put into um, actually making things really simply understood here. And I think we ended up with a far more complex 
narrative than we needed to. The interesting thing is it's not clear to me that the Greens and the Labor Party have actually worked out how to simplify the narrative. Um, I'm just curious about how much or if and if how much the federal structure impacted the decision-making process in Australia because it is a big deal, the national conversation in Canada. So I was wondering in Australia what that looked like. Um, it, it, uh, it wasn't that big a deal. I mean, the states that, um, that were run by conservative governments uh, you know, made a big, um, big play about how their costs would go up and this was unfair. But basically, that didn't really impact on the decision-making process, um, uh, either under the, um, the CPRS or under the, um, the carbon tax. Um, far more was actually about um, the, the way in which the Abbott opposition were able to uh, communicate very clearly um, what uh, the, the risks were. Uh, now, you know, these were completely, um, how do I say this diplomatically, uh, slightly exaggerated. Uh, you know, um, so Wyala, uh, which is a town of 30,000 people, um, which has um, predominantly uh, built around a steelworks, uh, was referred to as going to be wiped off the map. So it brought back, you know, sort of thoughts of, Dresden bombing campaigns in World War II, there'd be nothing there. Um, a leg of lamb was going to cost 100 Australian dollars. Um, uh, and, um, you know, this was just a tax on electricity. This was, you know... And basically, it's, it was very heavily influenced by the rhetoric of the extreme right sceptics in the United States. Um, yeah. Hi, I have a yep. quick question. What's the sectoral breakdown of emissions in Australia? You mentioned that there's a lot of coal-fired electricity. Yep. Is it primarily in the electricity sector? And what kind of direct actions are being taken by the Australian Commonwealth Government? Is there a, I believe there was some sort of national renewable energy target? Yeah, there is. Um, so let, let, me, um, let me start off the first part of your question. Uh, the bulk of our um, emissions uh, are related to um, electricity. We have virtually no um, hydro. We, we have a little bit, but not very significant. Uh, we have um, uh, no nuclear. So almost all of our electricity is coal-fired or gas-fired. Um, off the top of my head, I couldn't actually... I can't remember the exact um, uh, the exact details. I've, I've got them in in the hotel room. I don't know why I didn't bring it over. Um, but uh, the bulk of it is um, electricity generation, um, transport fuels, and um, then uh, it's fugitive emissions uh, and agriculture. So if you think about those. Uh, the argument mounted is that you know, forty percent of the emissions come from are associated with our resource exports, uh, and they are effectively displacing higher emitting um, commodities mined elsewhere in the world. That is because high high energy content of our black coal, low sulphur and the like, uh, and um, the very big expansion of our natural gas um, sector. Uh, when you look at the domestic um, uh, r domestic electricity generation in Victoria, which is the second biggest um, state, uh, it's almost all brown coal. So effectively, it's you, you, you're basically putting out about um, uh, 12, 12 tonnes per megawatt hour. Um, uh, in New South Wales and Queensland, it's black. So if you think about it, brown coal plants put out about 12, um, 12 to 13. Traditional black coal puts out about anywhere between 8 to 12, depending on the technology, 8 to 10. Um, open cycle gas, about 6. Closed cycle gas, about 4. 
So even within that, we could actually make some pretty significant emissions reductions. Uh, sorry, as follow-up question. I was reading a uh, report by a group called Beyond Zero Emissions based out of Melbourne a couple yep. years ago. And what uh, they were mentioning is that there's a lot of the coal plants in Australia are quite old. Yeah. What kind of uh, considerations have been made in terms of like a capital replacement policy saying you cannot build any new coal-fired power plants you have to phase out these plants by a certain date, such as the nuclear phase-out policy in Sweden or Germany? Yeah, so as part of the carbon tax package, um, there was uh, auction for closure, uh, and there was an intention to put in minimum standards, um, which would force out, over time, um, those older, older power plants. Uh, and, <coughs> excuse me, the, um, the really old ones are the ones in Victoria um, burning, burning brown coal. So you've got that sort of thing being re reinforced. The other thing you asked is what are the Commonwealth actions taken now um, under direct action? It's really basically uh, being a monopsony buyer of abatement through a reverse auction. That's really uh, the main thing. There's a renewable energy target, but let's be frank, um, renewable energy targets are a very inefficient way um, to uh, actually abate because... Um, Essentially, if you're having a renewable energy target and you've got a carbon price, what you're really saying is that I'm not prepared to have the carbon price rise high enough um, to actually achieve the abatement, so I'll do it through a, a less efficient way, which is a renewable energy target. Now, when you don't have the carbon price, the RET takes on a different role. Martin, I'll take the opportunity to go to something you said at the very beginning. I was struck when I first arrived in Australia and, and spoke to you and others, that at least within government, it, may, it didn't figure a lot in the public communication of the carbon tax as it was introduced in legislation, was a very, what I understood to be a concern or even a fear that if Australia didn't take action to price carbon it, itself, it was going to face down the road trade sanctions and mm -hmm. basically a price forced on Australia in the future as a resource and, uh, and as a... Uh, natural uh, petro, uh, hydrocarbon exporting economy mm -hmm. that would be even more costly and that as a country the argument was made that that you needed to begin doing this now internally before it was something was imposed without the ability to adapt was that argument uh, in fact a, a strong one within cabinet and within the political discussions because yeah. it didn't come out as I recall in the public domain terribly much it was very much put back on individual consumer, our responsibility, and therefore was vulnerable to questioning of the science and questioning of the cost. Uh, it, was, it was an argument that had um, quite a lot of weight in um, bureaucratic circles. Um, uh, because remember, at the time, uh, you've got a French government leading a push in the EU for the imposition of carbon tariffs. Um, uh, and uh, realistically, you know, if you believe the world is going to act, then the countries that are free riding are going to be punished in some way. And um, as I said, Australia is the most vulnerable um, developed economy in terms of both of its industrial structure and uh, environmental impacts. And so for those of us who are taking a, those of us in the bureaucracy who are taking a long view about policy development, this carried weight. We weren't thinking it was going to happen overnight, but the risk was there and it needed to be dealt with. Um, it wasn't something that carried any weight uh, in the public debate, and so it just didn't, it just didn't get a run. Good we're afternoon. Very, we're very heavily right-wing in this, um, <laughs> this gentleman over here next. Yeah. Thank you for coming. Thank you for coming and um, sharing your expertise and the insight from down under. Uh, my name is Joseph Pallant, Brinkman Climate. Here in British Columbia, um, we've had a carbon tax for about eight years now. Um, and it was really interesting to be reminded that even in Australia's case of when they did put in place a carbon tax, it was actually just a three-year transition period to a cap-and-trade system. Interestingly, the climate action plan put forward by Gordon Campbell was similar. It was going to be five years of carbon tax and then transition in 2012. Um, BC did have a dip um, that many say is caused by the carbon tax, but now we're almost back up to our level and going to miss our 2020 
carbon target uh, very significantly. Um, what would you suggest British Columbia do if they're serious about reducing their emissions given the policies in play? Uh, well, um, <laughs> Tom and I were just uh, having a cup of coffee about uh, before we came in here and exactly um, that issue. Uh, I understand there is work um, underway and will come out sort of uh, shortly with some proposals. Uh, but um, what I was saying to Tom was that uh, what struck me about what you've done here is that you deserve a really big pat on the back for having started the process. And the question is now, what are you going to do? Because a carbon price of $30 is going to help you at the margin with a bit of fuel switching, but it's not actually going to change anything significantly. Um, why, why is that? Because ultimately, if you're talking about assets that uh, are going to live for 20, 30, 40, 50 years, um, a carbon price of $30 is really not going to have much impact on my um, assessment about the desirability of investing in low emissions technology or high emissions technology. What you really need is a forward price schedule. Now, either because you have adopted a tax with clear escalators, and they don't have to be point estimates, they can be ranges, or whether you've adopted a emissions trading scheme with a clear set of reductions in, um, in the cap, and you've got a forward price that people can look at and say, OK, over the life of the asset, the price isn't going to be $30, it's going to be $150. Uh, that, it's that thing that's really important. In you terms of the efficiency of cap and trade previously, yeah, um, we have a lot of work to do. Um, do you think that there might be an, uh, the most efficient route to getting those emissions reductions? Oh, look. Um, so, from a conceptual level, uh, it doesn't matter whether you've got a carbon tax or or an emissions trading scheme. From a practical level, I think it does, but um, not to the point where I die in a ditch uh, to stop somebody having a. Ca a a carbon price via a tax rather than emissions trading scheme. But ultimately what we're dealing with is a stock problem. So it's the stock of emissions in the atmosphere. So that's what you've got to control. So what does the emissions trading scheme, a global emissions trading scheme, gives you control over the stock, whereas um, a global carbon tax gives you control over the price. And you've got to then take that second step and assume that you've got the price calibrated such that it gives you the stock reductions that you're looking for. Um, and I just think it adds a degree of complexity given what your ultimate target is. That said, with hindsight, I think um, uh, looking at your experience, uh, it's probably a bit easier to explain to the public. Whether or not they actually like it more um, is a different matter, but I do think it's easier to explain. And then there's a lady up here. Mm -hmm. uh, first, Dr. Parkson, thank you for a terrific, fascinating presentation. Um, I would like you to, if you would, to go back to your salience concept. And, um, and I know you can't, you don't have a crystal ball, but my sense is that as we watch what's happening in Canada, that, that Canadians are becoming increasingly literate um, and will want more than, than some of the feel-good opportunities, like you know, I, solar panels, for example. But I think Canadians are starting to see, or we're starting to see that Canadians want um, something that really is a meaningful contribution to solving a, a global problem. They're getting it more viscerally than before, I, mm. I, I think. And I'm just wondering what your sense is about the salience of, of the, the meaningful, so uh, the meaning of the Paris Conference, for example, and the significance of the UN Sustainable Development Goals for Australians, um, is this incremental kind of cautious approach that you're you're describing um, going to be salient? Or is it going to is it going to be enough in yeah. the next election? Um, anybody here ever been to a COP? Been to, were you in Copenhagen? Yeah. Unfortunately, that's 10 days of my life I'll never get back again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm really, I'm really, really sorry. 
Uh, look, my view is that um, uh, the, 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 the COP process will never deliver us the ac outcomes that we need as a globe. Um, you know, people love to talk about um, the importance of democracy and global governance. Well, you know, um, remember what happened in COP. Um, Venezuelan delegates stood up and slashed their wrists to get a bit of blood out and squeezed the blood out and said, this is the blood of my people. And you think, come on, you know. Fantastic theatre, fantastic grandstanding, but when any single country can veto action, you're never going to get... Um, you're never going to get uh, what needs to be done in time because somebody will always... It's a classic coordination failure. Somebody will always have a reason to wait till tomorrow to act. And in the way, that's, uh, the, way the UNFCCC is set up, they've got veto power. In fact, what you just need to do is get the 20 biggest emitters together. In fact, if you get the three biggest emitters together, then the rest of us will just fall into line. Uh, and I personally think we've got to start to think about using fora like the G20 um, and, um, and keep encouraging the US and the Chinese to, um, to talk. Uh, I don't think um, after the Copenhagen experience where in Australia it really was built up that we were going to Copenhagen, we were going to come back with a global deal and then, you know, everything was going to be, um, going to be okay. I suspect the Australian public will be very, very sceptical of anything that involves a UN-led um, uh, response. Um, I think the, the... On the other hand, um, I think disquiet about um, climate change is on the rise again. Uh, and as I said before, it really peaked in the 2000s because of the millennial drought, even though the drought can't necessarily be um, directly linked to it. But um, there's a real recognition that natural disasters have increased uh, in Australia. Uh, and, um, you know, it's like, if you haven't seen it, uh, Mark Carney um, gave a speech at Lloyd's on um, Tuesday night. It's well worth reading uh, because it, Mark goes through the financial stability aspects of climate change. Um, and in a country like Australia, where bushfires and droughts uh, are real problems, um, I think the community is seeing this and beginning to get concerned again. Uh, I suspect if, um, if, as it looks like, we might be in for another um, sustained drought, that uh, the political, uh, political <laughs> importance of climate change will rise quickly again. Uh, there was a lady here, and then, yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, my name's Connie Linder, and I'm the, um, the founder of Green Pages Directory. And uh, my question revolves around various policies. We, we, we've seen historically that governments are effective sometimes at imposing minimum standards, but it's the free market and it's innovators who really bring us leaps and bounds yep. beyond where we are today. Yep. Are any of the policies that your government uh, have done to target um, changes in behavior, were there any tax credits or incentives for innovators? Uh, not for um, innovators um, in the abstract, but there were um, programs under the, um, under the carbon tax um, package uh, which encouraged particular sectors to, um, to adopt existing technologies that were around but which hadn't been um, taken up. Um, uh, and uh, there's also been significant funding for uh, ARENA, the Renewable Energy Agency, uh, and also into um, carbon capture and storage. Uh, on, on CCS, um, if we can't crack CCS, uh, then um, we will have a much bigger challenge uh, than we will if we can um, get it to succeed. Uh, one of the things that I've always thought is I'm, I'm, I don't know whether CCS will work, but I'd rather know sooner rather than later so that if it wasn't going to work, 
we could actually be directing our, our efforts to, thing, to, to alternatives. Um, and the government um, put, the Rudd government put money into those schemes and then over time it basically raided that money and pulled it out. One of the things that um, was done though is a Clean Energy Finance Corporation which is um, uh, co-funding with private banks uh, a lot of um, uh, different projects around the country. And I actually think that's, that's an interesting model for fostering innovation. Martin, if I may, I'll put a final question to you, but I also invite people who want to speak to you further to, to come on up after the after this and, uh, and uh, ask you, uh, because I know you're quite ready to, to chat pe people who have a keen interest and I'm sure uh, others do. But if, let's imagine, and I don't think this is actually too far-fetched, that uh, somebody from a political party, whether it's the current government or one of the opposition parties, you know, comes to you and as you're sitting in Canberra and says, you know, we've concluded that, you know, we need to get, start up another carbon pricing scheme You've been involved in at least two previous ones. <laughs> Knowing just from the Australian national experience, you know, <laughs> not only if you had to do it all over again, but actually we're trying to do it all over again. What would you recommend that we do differently? What are the couple of key takeaways that you, oh. you'd give to a, to, particularly to a politician or a party that was thinking of formulating a new approach and was in the early stages, learning, looking over the long tangled history, both of the politically as well as the forecasting and the scale of the challenge and how those baseline shifts. Mm. Well, um, the first thing I'd say is never stop talking to the public. Um, interestingly, when uh, we, got the, we got to the point where the Rudd government and the Turnbull opposition were negotiating um, about the changes that would get support um, to get the CPRS through, uh, the government stopped communicating with the public and it started to have an inside the beltway discussion with the opposition and that created a vacuum and that vacuum was filled by everybody who was opposed to it and the people who were in support of action um, uh, who were sitting on their hands because the, the, the target um, was too weak in their view uh, they didn't come out and um, put a counterbalance and uh, uh, as a result, I think the public support for it dissipated really surprisingly quickly. Um, so that would be, be a key message. Uh, a second message would be to separate the how much from the how and say um, we want to get the mechanism right and we want to do that quite separately to what targets we adopt in the future. Um, now, that will not be acceptable to the green groups. Um, they will want to see the things done together. But I look across the Tasman um, at the uh, New Zealand experience. So when John Key, who's also a Conservative Prime Minister, when John Key became um, Prime Minister, uh, they had um, a, a legislated um, carbon price mechanism in place. Um, just about to, uh, to begin to bite. Uh, and Key set the price at zero and kept all the existing architecture in place. Um, and if you think about this, it seems odd, but why did he do this? His right wing wanted the thing abolished and he knew that having put in place the mechanism, it was a valuable national asset. And at some point, circumstances would change and he or some subsequent leader would need to dial up action. And having the scheme in place, having people to report against it, having the infrastructure there um, was something that therefore, when he needed to start it, all he had to do is flick the switch. And I actually think that that was really, really clever. Um, and I, uh, uh, there were some people in, in Australia who hoped that Mr Abbott might do that, um, but uh, uh, I think the difference was that um, nobody has ever accused John Key of believing climate change is crap. So 
key believes um, it's real and you need to act. And the question is really just about getting the politics of acting right. So don't throw away the instruments. Thank you very much. If we could just uh, have a round of applause. Thank you.